Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sonic Talk Show. It's been kind of big for Sonic as of late, if you can't already tell. By the time this reaches YouTube, it probably will be about the eve of Frontiers dropping its latest update. So I think what a better time for us to look back on some of Sonic's other, uh, more interesting adventures on the original golden days of the Sega Genesis, and even some other stuff on the arcade. So we've got a big episode planned on some of the spin-off games from the classic era of the Sonic games today. Yeah, there are some interesting ones here, some that have question marks associated with them. But the constant this episode is to, oh my god, they did not need to go this hard on a soundtrack for a spin-off game. Why does this go so fucking hard? Yeah, that can be how it really boils down to. So I think why don't we just hit the ground running and start off with the first spin-off game, whatever you want to call it, of Sonic the Hedgehog. That is, of course, Sonic Spinball. Spinball is a game that is known primarily for having the Archie characters, but like, why was it made though? That's the question that you always ask, right? Like, dude, like, why did they make this game? This is such a weird game. After the release of Sonic 2 in 1992, it was a commercial success. Of course it was. Sega wanted a new Sonic game to be released for the 1993 holiday season. However, the Japanese side of STI was busy making Sonic 3. So, the American branch of STI would be tasked to make a Sonic game aimed to be released holiday 1993, so that their game could then fall be preceded by Sonic 3. The concept for Spinball came from internal research showing Casino Night to be one of the most popular zones from Sonic 2. Developer Peter Morenic got the idea to merge the concept of the Amiga game Pinball Dreams, great fucking game by the way, with Sonic gameplay mechanics. With him and three colleagues, Morenic made animations depicting Sonic as a pinball. After showing the animations to senior Sega executives, the project was given the green light. With the goal to be released for holiday 1993, the team was giving an insanely tight schedule for release, considering this was supposed to capitalize on the series' popularity in North America. With the hope of speeding up production, Sega sent developers from Japan to help with the project, including artist Katsuhiko Sato, but the game was not projected to be finished in time despite this, which led the development team to change the programming language from assembly to C in the hopes of speeding up development. It's an atypical approach for Genesis games, causing it to have frame rate issues and optimization issues unfortunately. However, in the end, it seemed like it was worth it as the game was finished in a month. Just think about that for a second. This game was made in one month and was released in North American regions November 23rd, 1993. That's insane. The game is set on Mount Mobius, taking inspiration from Sonic Set AM, leading to the Freedom Fighters to cameo in the bonus stages, you've all seen this, along with Scratch from AOSTH. Additionally, the total Chaos Emerald count is 16 as opposed to the usual 7. Despite this, the game is considered canon according to Ian Flint as part of the Sonic lore team. Those are all the development notes we really have for Sonic Spinball. I do want to comment on this little fact about the canonity of the games. So, according to Ian, if you notice any discrepancies along any games which are said to be canon, like in this case, the Chaos Emerald count being 16 as opposed to 7, kind of just ignore that. For all intents and purposes, there are 7 Chaos Emeralds. And that's going to be the case moving forward if you notice any discrepancies. Yes. That being said, we should probably talk about this game. This is a weird one. <laughs> it kind of is. I mean, it's very bold for it to be the first spin-off Sonic game, Pinball. The way the game plays is that you play, obviously, as as Sonic, but each stage is designed like a, a pinball table. You have to go up, you have to make your way, you have to meet certain challenges, most of which are just unlocking the way through to get the Chaos Emerald at the end and continue onward. It has a live system, stuff like that. Losing all lives results in a game over. You can get uh, points such as with collecting rings or destroying badniks. Collecting 20 million points will grant the player an easy life. That sounds like a lot, but in pinball, you can really rack up those points. It's not as hard as it sounds. This is also interesting because the game actually does have progression. There are four stages in Sonic Spin. The four levels are called Toxic Pave, Lava Powerhouse, The Machine, and Showdown. The first three are more the typical pinball stages. Showdown is supposed to be the boss stage where you fight Robotnik trying to leave. I will say it. This game was made in a fucking month. How the fuck did they make the music so good? Oh, I know how. They got Howard Drawson on the project. 
Yeah, he's kind of a legendary video game composer for a lack of better words. Yeah, he is unreal when it comes to some of this shit. Toxic Caves is the most iconic song from this game. My god, that Genesis twang, that bass. It it, it does go harder than it should, arguably. I do want to comment, the machine stage, two things. The machine is noted here as saying it's a high-tech level where animals are roboticized. So this is where some of the sad AM inspiration came from. But the freedom fighters can be found more in the bonus stages that you go through between after meeting certain conditions. You kind of free them from, uh, I guess, roboticizing capsules like Bunny, Rotor, Sally, and I think Antoine are there. Yeah, there's a second bonus stage where Scratch from AOSTH is in as well. The machine also, I forgot to mention... Its art assets were reused from Cyber City Zone, the scrap level from Sonic 2. I believe we already talked about that in the podcast where we mentioned that, but it bears repeating because, hey, it's an interesting look at what could have been and STI reusing concepts to save time is uh, not a story that ends. I will say that much. <laughs> and, oh, oh, God. Uh, uh, I, I forgot uh, about something else. Uh, oh, the, yeah. What'd you, what'd, what'd you forget? The the options menu. There's a... Uh... <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna play the audio yeah, Fuck it. wait 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 wait, wait. You, you, know, you know what you know what i haven't listened to that options venue in a really long time hold on <laughs> so, so just to, just to let you know i think the the story goes that is that there was an error when it came to the audio uh audio configuration for the options venue. that that's that's what is often claimed yes I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm listening to it right now. It's, uh, I, I will say there is something funny. I think, uh, a Natalie Ford Drain, who's, uh, one of the artists, the cover artist for IDW Sonic, she made an animation with, uh, Surge, uh, rubbing her electric conductors to the beat of this song, and it's the funniest <laughs> shit imaginable. True, real, that's extremely powerful. Okay, so, I mean, yeah, the music goes absurd in this game every track is great um except the options menu it it just goes really hard it's so so what about the gameplay it's pinball there are sections where uh sonic is actually on the ground and you can spin dash and walk and you know do some stuff there but for the most part nope it's all pinball this leads to interesting scenarios if you like pinball like a certain somebody who we both know very well Thank you, Donnie. You will enjoy this game a lot. It's actually pretty well designed from that perspective. If you are a Sonic fan, this game is actually pretty infuriating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's not the kind of thing you really expect from a Sonic game. The pinball stages in you know, Sonic 2, Sonic 3, all that stuff, they're, they're fun for what they are, but... Imagine that for the whole game. (laughs) It's a lot. But I will say, if you do like pinball, this game is actually a lot of fun. There really isn't much more that we can say on the gameplay of Sonic's pinball. It is pinball. If you like pinball and you like a little bit of Sonic platforming here and there, it's pretty good. Objective-based pinball games, pretty cool. Clearing sections of the stage is fun. There's some unique elements in each of the, each of the levels. It's a, it's a legitimately good time if you like pinball. But again, if you don't like pinball, you probably won't like this game. Listen to the music. Besides the options menu music. Of course. The Japanese cover of this game uh, goes absurdly hard compared to the American cover, which looks mid. Yeah, I mean, that's the Sega 90 smell for you. That's all I can say. Look at that. Look at that, like, color splash. Look at that color gradient. It's beautiful. It's so fucking good. God damn. Yeah, but Sonic Spinball, it's a fun game. I like it. Plot-wise, I mean, there's very little to talk about. Uh, Mount Mobius, Sonic's gotta destroy the fortress inside and out. He destroys it. That's it. That That's it. I mean, hello, Freedom Fighters. Hello, Scratch from AOSTH. I mean, there are some other things I could say about that regarding those characters, but uh, I've talked about the sad I am enough for my lifetime, so... I think with Spinball, good game. Recommend you try it out. If it's not your thing, it's not your thing. But hey, give it a shot. You might like it. Yeah, it is an enjoyable time for what it is, at least. But like I said, your mileage may vary. Okay, so now we have to talk about the weird one. By the weird one, I mean the one that's not actually a Sonic game. Yeah, but it's still peak. (laughs) Who likes Puyo Puyo? I like Puyo Puyo. Have you ever wondered what Sega in the 90s tried to localize a Puyo Puyo game would look like? Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. 
This is a Puyo Puyo game. Reskinned. Entirely, by the way. Here's how it all goes down. Internally, what they did was, the story of the game is actually set on the Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog version of Mobius. Robotnik has kidnapped citizens of Beanville and is roboticizing them through a Mean Bean steaming machine. The main character is a guy named Has Bean, working to free the citizens of Beanville, facing Hengebots leading off to face Robotnik in the end, in which it is just Puyo Puyo matches. And for the record, the character Has Bean is a localization of the character of Puyo Puyo named Carbuncle. That's kind of what we're dealing with here. The localization of the arcade game Puyo Puyo, it was developed by Compile and Sega AM1 in Japan. That released there on December 18th, 1992. So Puyo Puyo was completely overhauled by its graphics and setting. All Puyo Puyo characters were changed and replaced for characters from AOSDH. However, the one thing that was left unchanged was the music. Composed by Matsunobu Tatsumoto and Ayanosuke Nagao, rearranged for the Mega Drive point by Masanori Hikichi and Naofumi Hayata. And it goes insane. Listen to the final boss music from this hold game. Hold on, hold on. You know, I've never actually listened to the final boss music. Oh! It, it, yeah, that's. I mean, I mean, this was a track that was remixed in Sonic Mania intentionally as a callback to Me Be Machine, but it's actually a Puyo Puyo callback. Anyways, do you like Puyo Puyo? You'll like this game. Uh, just play the original. It's a cute reskin of it. Nothing more to say there. There really is very little to say with this game which is kind of unfortunate because it's cute in that regard but at the same time it's like just 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 play Puyo Puyo bro it, it's a great game ever played uh what's it called Puyo Puyo Tetris it's a good it's actually a very good like mashup of the two gameplay styles I highly recommend that yeah Puyo Puyo Tetris fucks love Puyo Puyo Tetris so on that note let's move on to another more interesting game known as Sega Sonic the Hedgehog. So this is sort of, I guess our generation of Sonic fans kind of regards this in a more infamous tone just because of the nature of how it plays. But let's go into this. So very little of this game's development is actually known. In 2019, sound designer of the game Hiroshi Kawaguchi tweeted four images of the game's original design documents, one of which showing how the trackball controller was intended to be used. The game was released in June of 1993 in Japanese arcades and saw an extremely limited release in the West. The only known current location of a cabinet is in Galloping Ghost Arcade in Chicago. That's a lie. Arcade Odyssey has it in Miami. Oh, really? They do. Despite the games being released in the U.S., it was not localized. U.S. cabinets retained all Japanese text and voice acting which is very funny. There are remnants of a localization in the game's files, with both English text for the Splash dialogue and a rework of Eggman's sprites to model him as Sadayan Robot. The plot is, Sonic, Ray, and Mighty were kidnapped by Eggman and takes them to Eggman Island, trying to take them out with various traps. The trio make their way through the island, get to Eggman's control tower, where he triggers a self-destruct sequence to destroy the entire island. The three escape along with Eggman, but his Eggmobile falls into the ocean due to it running out of fuel. So the main reason why this game is even talked about to begin with, aside from it being the game where Ray and Mighty exist, crazy by the way, is that it has a special control scheme. You use a trackball. You push Sonic, Ray, and Mighty in different directions and with a single button to jump. Due to this reason, it has been extremely difficult to emulate, both officially and unofficially. Yuji Naka said this was the reason why the game was not included in the Sonic Gems collection. And of course, according to Ian Flynn as part of the lore team, the game is canon and set sometime after Sonic 3 and Knuckles. I've played this game. Eh, it's fine. So, okay. I played an emulated version which used a stick instead of the trackball. I thought it was fine. It was an arcade game. It was cute. If you had to play this shit with the trackball, I'd kill myself. I feel like having to constantly roll will murder your wrist eventually. Especially with the kind of... The way this game plays. You kind of have to be constantly moving. So... I will say this um, right now. This game has a lot of really good sprite art. There's a lot of great facial expressions and animations. It's Sega at one of their peaks in terms of uh, arcade sensibilities, just going at it. So, you know, they were the kings of the arcade for many, many, many years. I mean, I've never played it myself, so I can't really speak too much about how the game plays exactly. It is funny how they didn't even bother localizing it, or at least they tried to, but were like, nah, fuck it, we don't care. Just send it out there. People aren't going to play this anyway. I do like that, uh, does it introduce Mighty or reuse him from Knuckles Chaotix? 
I think it may introduce Mighty. It, in- it introduces Mighty, yes. Along with Ray. Yes. I mean, there's really not much to say on this one other than it all right. Yeah, it's, it's all right. I mean, what is it? The review scores, uh, they have one review score here from Electronic Gaming Monthly. It gave it a 10 out of 10. All right. Okay. Anyways, let's actually get to probably what is going to be the game that we talk about the longest this episode. Knuckles Chaotix. Really? From like 1994? Ah, why did I make that joke, man? I should really just go and jump into a fire pit for, for my sins. Holy, bro. I I felt the, the cringe you move through my body, much like chi. That was the worst sentence you've ever said, man. Jesus. I can't believe I topped that from the last time. I know, bro. Bro, what the fuck? Anyways, yeah, so Knuckles Chaotix, you know about this game. Everybody knows about this game by this point. The development of Knuckles Chaotix can be traced from an internal Sega Mega Drive demo called Sonic Crackers. <laughs> Thank God I'm not on Twitch. I can't get banned. Yes, exactly. Seeing Sonic and Tails joined together by a tethered ring, having to use their combined strength and speed to move through stages. The game was never announced, but the pitch was seemingly accepted and brought over to the Sega 32X edition to the Mega Drive. Okay, so the Sega CD... They also got the 32X. The 32X is dog shit. The only game on it that actually anybody remembers from it is Knuckles Chaotix. And that's it. It's really funny the way that the history of the 32X is like quite fascinating because at the same time they released this, they also released the fucking Sega Saturn. Already its own dedicated 32-bit console. The only reason they made it, I swear to God this is the reason, was because the CEO of Sega of America said we wanted to have like a, a less pricey version to bring gamers into the 32X world, which is like, that's really weird, man. I don't, I, Sega in the 90s, man, this company is full of hubris. I swear to God in this era. I digress though. I, if you really want to see like the good, I, I guess, full scope of like why exactly the 32X was kind of a mistake, I, I kind of recommend, uh, James Rolfe's Angry Video Game Nerd video about it. I think it, it's a compilation, including of all of the Sega Genesis add ons. Anyways, from the move, Sonic sprites would be reused for Mighty the Armadillo and Tails scrapped entirely. Additionally, this game was developed simultaneously with the 32X. As a result, the game has a color screen test in a range of somewhat needless graphical effects to show up the capabilities of the 32X. Over the years, 12 different prototypes of Knuckles Chaotix would be leaked, showing development of the game at various points in time. Knuckles Chaotix would be released in North America in March of 1995. And fun fact, it was only ever re-released once. It was re-released on a now-defunct classic game cloud streaming service, the name of which... If you put a gun to my head, I could not tell you. It was very forgettable. Here, I got you. Game tap. Yeah, you want to know why? Because I have the Sonic Retro page pulled up. (laughs) (laughs) Outside of that, never officially re-released. Let's just talk about the game's story. Set a few months after the events of Sonic 3 and Knuckles, an upheaval occurs in the South Sea. An island revealed created by tectonic movement caused by the Master Emerald. Furthermore, the power of the Master Emerald causes the island to transform from its rocky appearance to a green paradise. This leads Knuckles to go investigate, wondering if the place has remnants of an ancient civilization which was wiped away by a power stone. The classic games to have a lot of callbacks to this ancient civilization. Very interesting. I wonder what that could be foreshadowing. Maybe this is the maybe this is the the, the shit that Ian like cooked for for Frontiers. He looked at the classic lore and was just like, "Damn, there's a lot of ancient civilization shit in here. Maybe I can just work something with this." And that's how he came up with the fucking ancients. Hey, look at that. Eggman himself also found the island and finds a ring with some ancient texts, learning the island was once home to a lost civilization. This leads him to a larger ring, much like the ones found on Angel Island. He found the ring can guide him to a power stone, which he believes to be the Master Emerald but that was already moved to Angel Island. However, the space within the ring holds latent chaos energy, which turns power rings into chaos rings. Eggman thinks if he can figure out the secrets of these rings, he may be able to discover the secrets of the rings used by Sonic. Eggman would then convert the island into his newest research base, the Neutrogic High Zone. When Knuckles arrives to Neutrogic High, he finds Eggman already there, converting the Chaos Rings into artificial dark rings, along with developing a ring power used to bind rings together. Then, he follows to Isolated Island, finding Espio trapped in an Eggman investor, the Combi Catcher. 
They find Eggman leaving this island along with Metal Sonic, heading out to Neutrogic High to search for the two of them. Along the way, they find others on the island. Vector, Charmy, Mighty, Heavy, and Bomb, who came to the island for their own reasons and joined the adventure. At the end, the group fights off Metal Sonic, but Eggman arrives with a giant Dark Ring and powers Metal Sonic up into Metal Sonic Kai. Upon defeat, the ending will vary depending on if you've collected all six Chaos Rings. If you have none of them or only up to five, the remaining rings will circle around the Dark Ring and then shatter. Eggman laughs with a scene of Metal Sonic Kai burning down a city as the credits roll. What the hell? Yeah, it's very insane for no reason. Anyways, if you have all six rings, the rings will rotate around a line of text saying, Cool! The credits roll showing the cast of the game along with Sonic and Tails arriving late on the tornado. Okay, so I can speak to this game a lot. I played it recently just to have something to say on this podcast. The game, the gameplay of this game, I want to say feels like a typical classic Sonic game, but it's not. In fact, I'll go as far as to say this feels like it's a Sonic game from like an alternate dimension, honestly. It, it, it plays like a classic Sonic game. It feels right as far as I can tell, but something's off. Something is off. What is it? I don't know. I can't say. I can tell you what's off about this fucking game. It's the ring mechanic. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. There is actually a lot of positive things in this game. The art, the graphics. Oh yeah, the graphics are beautiful. Probably the best looking classic Sonic game. 32 bit, beautiful color palette, amazing, amazing looking backgrounds and visuals. This is also a problem because it's hard to tell what is actually the foreground and what is standable on in some levels. And that becomes a really, really big problem at times <laughs> because, because this game is designed left to right. It's designed bottom to top. You work your way upwards. So when you can't tell where you're standing, you fall down. Oh, oh, we're, oh, we're, getting, we're getting ahead of ourselves. The music. Oh my God. This game, so many. Very underappreciated soundtrack in this franchise. Incredibly good songs across the board. Great percussion use. The sound font is beautiful. It's just, it's so good. That is its one uh, uptick is the music, as always. And now to talk more about the, uh... The gameplay mechanic in which you are playing as one character. Could be anyone. Knuckles, SBO, Vector. Any, any of these characters, right? You also have a secondary character that you have to handle. Let's put it. You have to handle them because you are tethered to each character by a joined ring. Now, it actually can give you a lot of options for movement. Don't get me wrong. It, it does let you launch yourself higher up. <laughs> I don't know if it works very well. I don't really think so. It does not. There is a twofold problem at play here. One is that the ring mechanic itself is poorly implemented. The physics do not work in the way that you want them to. You want to move fast? impossible. You have a partner behind you who will eventually get stuck on something and then slingshot you the other way. You want to try and hold your partner? Sorry, fat chance. You can't hold your partner while you're going up slopes. Well, I mean, going up a vertical, a direct vertical slope. You want movement? Sorry, you're struggling. Couple this with the fact that the combi catcher, which is one of the game's central mechanics, every time you go to a new act, you have to choose a new party member. So there's obviously Knuckles, there's Mighty, there's SBO, there's Charmy, and there's Vector. You can choose those characters, but your partner you have to choose at random. You can influence it, but only so much. Bomb and Heavy, however, are dud characters. Heavy, especially with how big he is, will immediately stall any forward momentum you have. Bomb can explode, and when he explodes, he also can damage you. Do you see the problem here? You are in a game that is expecting you to go from the bottom to the top, and your physics are constantly impeded by an AI partner that is trying its hardest to keep up. It doesn't work. It's actually very infuriating. And this is a really big problem. It, it just, it doesn't, doesn't function right. And that's what sucks. It's because there is the groundwork for a good game here. But this ring tethering mechanic, it just... That, and I can also say that the level design of the game feels very samey. It doesn't help that you don't play the levels in like a sequential order. What it, how it works is that you finish a stage, you're at the like main menu of the game, so to speak. You go through the combi catcher, you get your partner, all that stuff. And then after that, you go through basically a roulette wheel where you have to hit a bumper and the roulette wheel will randomly stop on any of the five levels in the game, which are Botanic Base, 
Speed Slider, Amazing Arena, Techno Tower, Marina Madness. There are five stages to play through. Once you go through all those stages, it will black itself out so the roulette wheel won't choose it again. But you are kind of fighting with the game if you want to play the game in a certain order. And even then, it's because of that system where the whole game kind of feels samey. The level design just kind of feels like it's all the same. And the only thing that's different is the aesthetic. I mean, you can also go one step further and, and, and remind everyone that there are five acts in each of these fucking zones. That is way too much. And these are not short stages. Some of these can be very long. You will get frustrated as fuck as you try to navigate them. Yeah, and some of them even have mission gimmicks in the level where if you don't meet the missions and you get to the stage, you have to replay it. In fact, I think, what was it? In the stage Techno Tower, there is a mission in each of those stages where you have to find a clock and turn it on to basically power the level. And if you complete a level without doing that, you fail the mission and you have to go back and replay that level. Do you want to do that? No, I don't even want to do this the first time. It is um, extremely confusing, TM. Anyways, there is a positive to this game. I think the special stages are all right. They are the most unique special stages the series has ever had. And honestly, they're very fun. They're good. They're pretty good. It's a um, 3D wireframe pipe that is rendered in real time, which is pretty impressive for the 32X. It's a flex, but uh, they're pretty fun. Usual hexagonal maze shit. You shift from plane to plane. And I like it. I like it a lot. As do I. This game also did include a couple of unique ideas. One of them is that there is a, a combined ring power-up that allows you to condense all your rings into a single ring. So that if you get hit, you can collect that one ring and get all your rings back. But it also comes with the draw. If you can't catch it, then you're kind of gamered. Yeah, this would be brought back for Mania as the uh, hyper ring with a uh, slightly different function. There are several small individual callbacks and references this game gets. This is also the game that really is kind of left in the dust. Chaotix has a legacy in some ways, but a lot of its legacy has just been kind of... The Chaotix get brought forward, but... In. It's complicated. The legacy of this game is very complicated because there is a good game underneath it all. But what is this? Oh, I, I see this in the trivia thing. The game was originally planned to be included in Gems Collection, but was cut due to the difficult nature of emulating the 32X software. Kega Fusion did it in 2009. Hmm. Anyways, yeah, so that's our opinion on Knuckles Chaotix. Uh, it sure is a video game. There was one other game that came out during this time that many would be considering probably the most important game of this era. And it's the one that, ironically enough, actually kind of has a deep legacy. Sonic 3D Blast, developed by Traveler's Tales, primarily for the Mega Drive. However, of course, a port for the Saturn was developed alongside the game to make up for the cancellation of Sonic Extreme. Sonic 3D Blast is a weird one. Its development is interesting. And what's even more interesting about it is that it's also kind of a big reason why the Sonic Adventure soundtrack fucks so hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that in a second. The Saturn port itself was made in seven weeks with it having FMVs, higher quality graphics, and a different special stage, along with a CD quality soundtrack composed by the man, Richard Jock who would compose the next Traveler's Tales game, Sonic R. For the Mega Drive version of the game, however, the soundtrack was completely different and composed by our guy, Jun Sanoi, which was very interesting considering this game, the Mega Drive version of the game, that is, never released in Japan. And that's probably why Sano reused all his compositions for adventure to allow the Japanese audience to hear it. Yeah, so there are a ton of tracks um, that uh, Jun made for Beauty Blast that got reused in adventure, full-blown remixes, and they all sound amazing. Every single one. I believe to call one out, uh, I believe it's Green Grove Zone, which is the first one in the game, was reused for Windy Valley. Yes. It's the section uh, after you ascend the tornado. You're up in the sky. Yeah. Panic Puppet Zone Act 1 was reused for Twinkle Park and Sonic Adventure. Oh, yeah. Wait, by the way, there was a, uh, there, there, there were some songs that were found. There was an unused version of the boss theme that uses the fucking Sonic 4 boss theme, by the way. <laughs> that's the funniest thing. And you want to know, I have something that's even funnier. Diamond Dust Zone was technically reused for Sonic Chronicles. You would never be able no, to tell. No, you would don't. Never don't, be don't, able don't. to tell. But boom, allegedly. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> 
<laughs> you would never be able to tell. We pretend we do not see it. Anyways, depending on what region you lived in, the game's titled differently. North American regions named the game Sonic 3D Blast, but in Europe it was named Sonic 3D Flicky's Island. The game would then release in North America on, in November 9th, 1996 for the Mega Drive, and then on the second Saturn in November 21st, 1996. In 2017, the lead programmer of the Mega Drive version of the game, John Burton, revealed that he was working on an unofficial director's cut patch of the game, featuring improved controls, gameplay options such as a debug mode, level password system, time attack, and playing a Super Sonic. Which is cool. Okay. Can I say it? Say it. Sonic the Hedgehog, Foreman Day Mid. <laughs> It, it sucks because, like, I, I know there are a lot of people who really like 3D Blast, but uh, I'm going to tell you a little personal anecdote from my childhood. I don't know what it is, but every time I tried playing through Sonic 3D Blast, I just got insanely nauseous. I don't know what it was. I, maybe it was the isometric gameplay, but trying to play through the game, I felt nauseous. This game is very repetitive. So, basically... You have to find five flickies in each section of the stage by destroying enemies. You then go up to a big ring, you flip into them, you get to the next section of the stage. The level design is nothing to write home about since it's isometric early 3D. It's just sort of there. Like, it's not bad. Just... It's eh. Yeah, it's not bad. Uh, maybe the Saturn version, maybe more of some people's speeds. The Genesis version is more readily accessible from what I understand. You know, maybe, maybe that could be more someone's speed, even though uh, that was made to try to get a game out because Sonic Extreme was canceled, but more on that in the future, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, the game's all right. So what we will say, though, the soundtracks... Both of them go hard. Yeah, the Sano soundtrack is a lot more sonic but the saturn soundtrack is very atmospheric and goes really hard uh, the the jock stuff is all great and there is something that we can say about sonic 3d blast the saturn special stages are godlike amazing music track incredible graphics for the time it's so much fun they're easy but they're great they're so much fun I will say also for the Saturn version, they do kind of expand more and try to utilize the Saturn's capabilities, like different weather effects on different stages for the game. Like I think Rusty Ruin Zone has like a fog effect over the stage and um, Volcano Valley Zone has this heat haze effect to it. All right, they're trying to expand on the game. I won't say no to that. It's, uh, I mean, here's the thing. The Saturn version has technically never been re-released, so if you want to play it, you're going to have to do it through emulation. But it is kind of the ideal version of the game. If you're going to play that, if you're going to play 3D Blast, you're going to want to play it on the Saturn. And Saturn emulation is a lot more accessible nowadays, so I would recommend doing that. There really is not a lot to talk about with this game. Me and Speed are uh, not huge fans of this one for many different reasons. Um, we don't think it's bad necessarily um but we're just kind of it, it, it just is so let's let's talk about something a little bit more interesting before before we go on any further i'd like to inform everyone that uh, we have a sponsored segment for this podcast shout outs to a uh, known uh, south florida fighting game legend danny currently one of the best 10 players in south florida who has graced us with a quote about our next game, Sonic the Fighters, in his work. Sonic the Fighters is the best animated Sonic game of all time and has the best soundtrack of any side game. That game is like three tweaks away from being genuinely great. You guys in the internet are just mean. Thank you, Danny. Uh, if you want to see him and his clips, you can watch Evo Top 8 for Grand Blue. He got 7th. He is an extremely good player. Uh, shout out to my boy. Uh, I love you. You're a wonderful human being. Thank you for providing with this, with this quote. Back to our regularly scheduled content. Okay, so Sonic the Fighters. This is a game that is horribly misunderstood by the community. Genuinely horribly misunderstood. It's ridiculous how people view this game. Because Sonic fans are not fighting game fans. They're not. And that's the unfortunate thing. Because Sonic the Fighters is actually like an extremely competently made fighting game and for very good reason as we're about to get into the development of this game begins at sega's oldest video game development team sega am2 by name of the developer masahiro sugiyama he was working on the game fighting vipers and inserted sonic and tails as secret bonus characters purely out of boredom that effort was seen by yu suzuki <laughs> known snake oil salesman yu suzuki <laughs> oh god i don't want to get into that he is the head of am2 and showed it to hiroshi katakoa the head producer of the team which led for it to be shown to yuji naka now katakoa was quite worried since sonic was more of a child focused franchise he thought naka would not be super respective to it but to his surprise naka was and he even commented 
I couldn't think of Sonic as a fighting game and was worried whether Sonic could fight with his short hands and big head. But Mr. Yu encouraged me. We were delighted. And actually, by this point, no one had really attempted Sonic in full 3D. 3D Blast was isometric uh, 3D gameplay, so it technically wasn't true 3D. So this is where it truly tried out for the first time. Sonic the Fighters was technically Sonic the Hedgehog's 3D debut and had Yuji Naka's full support. Going so far as to give the Sonic the Fighters team a Sonic figurine to try to reference Sonic in a 3D space. So after development, the game would release in Japanese arcades in May 1996, running on the Fighting Vipers engine on Sega Model 2 hardware. A cabinet would also see release in the West starting July 1996 under the name Sonic Championship, but much like with Sega Sonic the Hedgehog, extremely limited release in the West. The most notable place to have the game was the Palisade Center Ice Rink in West Nyack, New York, which had it since its opening in 1998, but was replaced in 2013. However, a Saturn home port was advertised in various gaming magazines, but was quietly cancelled with no explanation as to why. Very sad, because that is a game that definitely should have had a home release. Yeah, it really should have. I feel like it would have helped the legacy of Sonic the Fighters a lot, knowing Sega at the time and their opinions on the Saturn. Uh... Very bizarre, you know, you could have, uh, I mean, I don't know, man. What time is that? July 1996? I mean, I don't know. Maybe a game you were really hoping for gets canceled and you could have had something in the back pocket. You didn't have to rely on something else. What do I know? What do I know? So, the game's story begins with Sonic and Tails seeking Eggman, releasing large amounts of robots around the world. Sonic and Tails get a call from Espio showing a video of these robots being released from the Death Egg 2. Sonic decides to travel to the Death Egg 2 alone using Tails' rocket, the Lunar Fox, only with a single seat. However, it requires the power output of eight Chaos Emeralds. So many, so fucking inconsistent. Again, shit. it's canon, but it's a discrepancy. Ignore the discrepancy. Sonic friends around the world are guarding them, but one of them was stolen by Fang. When Sonic and Tails go to Knuckles to get his emerald, Knuckles is told what is going on and provoke Sonic, saying the strongest among them should be the one to challenge Eggman. They are about to brawl, Tails gets between them, and says to do it in a fair match in the ring. At one point, Eggman arrives to clone your character as a mirror match. At the end, the character you are playing as gets all the Chaos Emeralds, gets in the rocket to challenge Eggman directly. However, they are met by Metal Sonic guarding Eggman. After defeating him, the Death Egg 2 begins to crumble, with Eggman in his Emax suit coming out to fight. Using the power of the Chaos Emeralds, you are able to defeat Eggman and escape the Death Egg 2 in the Lunar Fox. In the post credit scene, we see Eggman and Metal Sonic surviving the explosion and heading back to Earth. People know this game for one specific reason, Sonic Jams Collection. It was re-released under the name Sonic the Fighters and then remastered in 2012 for the PS3 and Xbox 360 as an Xbox Live Arcade version and a Sony PS3 uh, online title. Uh, the re-release included online play, a tournament mode for up to six players, additionally included Eggman, Metal Sonic, and most importantly, Honey the Cat as a bonus character. Honey was originally added in secret by Sugiyama in the original arcade machine, but was unable to fully finish putting her in the game. However, the Xbox Live Arcade version rectified this and allows Honey to be playable. Honey is actually a character from Fighting Vipers who was, in a weird twist of fate, turned into a Sonic character for this. And now she is a beloved Sonic character in the sense of, you know, the Archie comics and she's She's much more well-known, and people would like to see her come back in some fashion. Yeah, she does have a cameo in one of the uh, classic-era uh, IDW comics. So she is out there. She is a Sonic character in her full right. We just gotta see her again. Hey, maybe Sonic Superstars, DLC characters. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, funny. Okay, so this game is horribly misunderstood. This is a fighting game. Like, a real-ass fighting game. Is it deep or complex? Actually, yes. This game has a very interesting system um, for blocking. There is a barrier system that the barrier system has stocks to it. That means that your options in guarding are limited, and if your barriers get broken, they don't come back for the rest of the match. Not the round, the match. Which means you have to balance offense and defense accordingly. It's actually a really unique system that I think adds a lot of uniqueness to the game. There's also a way to spend your barrier gauge in something that's called hyper mode, which allows you to like boost your attacks and get more combos. It's surprisingly nuanced. And like my boy Danny said, 
it's about three tweaks away from being a genuinely great game. It's legit for what a fighting game is. And I mean, Fighting Vipers has a similar system with its barriers as well, along with the hyper mode. It's also kind of most known for if you're playing as Sonic during the arcade mode and you're able to go through without losing a match, you can fight Eggman as Super Sonic. Right, and it makes the fight a lot easier. Additionally, I mean, listen, I got to agree with my with my guy Danny here. You can't tell me that that, that that Sonic the Fighters doesn't look fucking insane for its time. And look, we have Sega AM2 to thank for that because all of their arcade games look incredible. I mean, oh my god, the background work, all the detail, all the animation work that goes into it, it looks incredible it really is the gameplay does kind of leave a little bit to be desired although the combos in the game are relatively simple you have a punch a kick and barrier options however here's the thing though most people learned about this game through the gems collection and if you try to play through the game the game doesn't exactly tell you what buttons correspond to which so if you have the uh the the menu layout that says okay here are your combos it gives you punch kick and barrier the thing is you're probably playing on a gamecube controller or on a ps2 controller you're like what what do you mean by that what which one is which tell me it doesn't tell you so you kind of have to figure it out a little bit on your own that kind of does affect its legacy a little bit as a result. But still, we did get a re-release in 2012, but it was locked to Xbox Live and PS3. So listen to me, Sega, all right? It, I'm, I'm here pleading with you, okay? This is a legit game. This is a legit fighting game here. I can see a future where this is at Evo. Not main stage, <laughs> don't get me wrong. I'm not crazy. Sonic the Fighters 2! Hey, 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 listen. <laughs> Listen, we already have that. It's called Sonic Smackdown, number one. <laughs> That's a fan project. Still. But, still. But, 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 but. Not but. main stage at Evo, but we could. We could. I'm not delusional. <laughs> Here's the thing. Cool. <laughs> release. <laughs> release it on Steam. If you want to go sicko mode with this, roll back. I guarantee you, you will have interest. Even if you want to sell it for like $20, $30, maybe it's a little steep, it will sell. I guarantee you it will sell. The game is so unique. It's so beautiful. I, I, I genuinely have a special place in my heart for this. And I'm not even that big of a fighting game fan. I'll be real with you. I just kind of think this is a very special game especially from this era of Sonic games. It's very unique and I think it deserves a chance to live on. Yes. I also want to make special note of the soundtrack. Um, often underrated. It is extremely fucking good. Also, live update from Danny. He says that this is the actual first 3D Sonic game, if you really think about, and half of the ones that come after don't even look as good as this game, technically. No, and he's not wrong. Sega AM2 was known for how, like, graphically inclined their arcade games are. Not only does it hold up, Danny's right, it looks a lot better than a lot of future 3D Sonic games do. Oh yeah, you know, hey, we also kind of forgot to mention that this game was also the appearance of two characters that would come to become beloved in the franchise of who are oh yeah that's right bean and bark yeah bean and bark make their debut in this game that's all they're really here for <laughs> yeah they just kind of show up which is very funny uh also technically bean is not a sonic original character per se he's actually from another sega am2 game called uh dynamite ducks with the duck spell d-u-x Ah, <sighs> God. Sometimes yeah, the it's... crossovers, yes, they're just wild. Anyways, yeah, Sonic the Fighters. Uh, there's a great video on it by uh, Guile Winquote, which talks about it and a lot of the misunderstandings with it. It goes a little bit more in-depth with mechanics. Pretty good game. Uh, I'd recommend you play it. Check it out. It's fun. Okay, the big one. <laughs> there is There is no way we are ending this episode off on anything, but what is the most oft-discussed fucking video game of this era. Oh my god. Can you feel the sunshine? Does it brighten up your day? Sonic R. What even needs to be said about this game? A lot, actually. You'd be surprised. Yeah, so this is a very interesting game. So to start, this was the second Sonic game made by Traveler's Tales, head of studio John Burton and lead artist John Cunliffe. Like 3D Blast, the project was overseen by members of Sonic Team giving requirements and feedback, which of course they implemented. Sonic Team themselves designed the tracks on paper, which Traveler's Tales recreated as 3D models. Some of the text work resembled the work seen in Sonic 3D Blast originally, but were redone for the final project. The game was demoed at E3 1997 and took player feedback when finding that people 
gave up when Sonic hit water and slowed down really slowly, so they sped up water movement for the final release. They also revealed a relay race mode was planned where each lap would be done by a completely different character along with a mirror mode. However, they would have to be scrapped due to the draw code needed to be rewritten completely to compensate for its changes from John Burt. The development team also had to lower the polygon count for performance reasons. This resulted in Tails losing his whiskers and hair, Knuckles' shoes had to be redesigned, Eggman's missile attack had to be simplified, and Amy had the most radical redesign as she had to drive in a car to keep up with most of the other characters. Her car was originally supposed to have a front-facing buzzsaw as an attack along with a rear spoiler, those of which being removed. Okay, you know what? We're not even going to talk about the game first. We have to talk about the soundtrack. Soundtrack done by Richard Jock himself. Of Richard Jocks and legend TJ Davis. Oh my lord. These tracks. Unfucking real. It's very interesting because a lot of people will point to this and say, oh, this doesn't sound like Sonic music. Okay, number one, shut the fuck up. You're a nerd and a loser. I'm pushing you into a locker. It's fantastic music. They're fun. They're fun tracks. And I mean, listen, you're telling me you don't want to race to some 90s pop music? You're a liar. You're, you're cringe. 90s Euro pop is peak and it feels right at home for Sonic. Every song on the soundtrack is a banger. Goddamn fantastic. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, so you have the playable characters initially as Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, Amy, and Eggman. So Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles race on foot. Amy has to race in a car, and because of that, her fidelity is a little awkward, along with uh, Eggman. However, the game also has five alternate playable characters, which are Metal Sonic, two characters appearing for the first time, Tails Doll, Metal Knuckles, along with Egg Robo. The fifth playable character is actually Super Sonic, which you get after completing the game with all the Chaos Emeralds. But we're, you don't care about that. You don't care about any of this shit. Listen, the Tails Doll. Our generations of Sonic fans know the Tails Doll a little too well because of some, uh, how do I put this? Because I don't have very fond memories of it. It's cringe, honestly. How would you describe this, Aaron? <sighs> Me, when I'm in 2009 and getting spooked by the Tails Doll. I don't know. Yeah, so the subject, Tails Doll is a subject of a creepy pasta, as it is known, internet legends, uh, spooky, scary internet stories. Or, honestly, I don't even remember. Like, the Tails Doll, like, follows your playable character, attacks you, come, come, kills the character, jumps out the TV, the ring, oh, spooky, you die. Death, destruction, gore, ugly. Yeah, stuff like that. I don't really have a fondness for it because I'm not a horror fan at either way, but just sort of like, this is really lame. <laughs> what is this? But yeah, Tails Doll and Metal Knuckles as well are the main, I guess, memories that a lot of people have of this game just because they were never really reused ever again in the games. The comics, both in Archie and IDW, showed some love to those characters, especially IDW, I mean... The, the classic Sonic 30th anniversary title showed them very proficiently. I remember both in Archie and IDW, Tails also commented like, why do Sonic and Knuckles get robots and I get this thing? That's cringe. And he's right. It is cringe. I don't know what this it is, is about. It is extremely cringe. But anyway, the tracks. The tracks of the game, there are five. You have the initial stage Resort Island. Radical City, Regal Ruin, Reactive Factory, and Radiant Emerald. Resort Island is your basic introduction. It's a seaside resort island, pretty simple. Radical City is, as you can suggest, it is a city stage backdrop where you're running through the highways. Regal Ruin has this pyramid theme aesthetic to it. It's very nice. It actually is very nice. Reactive Factory is just a factory layout, also very simple. Radiant Emerald is actually very interesting because I believe the track itself is inside a Chaos Emerald, which a lot of people don't really know. It's a little strange, but it has very, very nice visual effects. Released on the Sega Saturn, so I guess they had some nice graphical fidelity to work with there. But yeah, the stages are not amazing by themselves. The game is most remembered by its music. That's all I can really add on top of that. Yeah, the Saturn version is often what's discussed. It's not the good... <laughs> It doesn't control well. The PC version, though, eh, it's not bad. Yeah, and that's what the version is based off of in Gems Collection, for the record. It's the PC yeah. version. A lot of discussion has been had about um, Sonic R over the, the years, and a lot of people say it's a flawed but charming take on a Sonic racing game. I'd agree. It's not very good, but it's charming. And I feel like something that's interesting is that Sonic R is only one of the more considered attempts to merge the design of classic Sonic the Hedgehog with the car racing genre. I mean, most of the characters are on foot. Feels like there should have been more of these, but we never got them. 
Yeah, there is another, I have two interesting tidbits. So the first thing is, I remember, uh, this was happened recently. I was with some friends of mine. We were celebrating my birthday. We went to Tampa Comic Con. We came back to their place and they decided like, yeah, we were watching Malcolm in the Middle. Do you want to join us? I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? We had pizza. We had a good time. We were watching one episode. I don't remember what episode it was, but it was where Malcolm and Stevie were like in his room playing video games. They were playing fucking Sonic R. I got fucking jump scared. I can't escape Sonic for the life of me. It was a very funny moment amongst all of us. That's the first thing. The second thing about Sonic R to me is, I learned how to speed run this game. It's been a long time since I have attempted this. I think there may be a video of mine that's much older. If you want to dig back in my catalog, it may be there somewhere. I did learn how to speed run Sonic R. And by learning that, I figured out just how jank this fucking game is. Oh, good lord. It has Traveler's Tales kind of like touches on it that make the game technically viable because what they do is is that they just kind of leave a lot of stuff up left out because they just present the game in front of you and just say what is in front of you technically works and you can do things that you don't normally do for instance i believe it's in reactive factory half of that game stage maybe more like 40 percent does not have collision detection you can like mess around and go through and like skip certain specific points and just kind of jump over it. I just going directly on the game's uh, out of bounds area. Aw, oh, dude. Yeah, it's just the, the Traveler's Tales magic. And not only that, he, let me give you some speedrun strats, if I remember correctly. You play as Knuckles, you set the game to all snow stages because that freezes the water so that you can run over the water and you have more options in movement. Knuckles can glide so that actually gives you the most range and vertical movement. In Radiant Emerald in particular, what you can do is that where I believe the level has this winding twist where you have to go down like a corkscrew kind of thing. If you jump at just the right time, I don't remember where, you jump and glide at exactly the right time, Knuckles can glide into another area of the level track where you can clip in and you skip like 30% of the level. Huh. Yeah, you basically are like right in front of the flag check when you do that. It's a trick I was never able to fully master, but that is possible. Well, I learned something new today. I'm trying to remember. What was my personal best? I think it was like a little under 10 minutes, like 9.50 or something like that. Yeah, more or less. I don't know. Maybe I'll try to dig it up if I can feel so inclined. But yeah, it's out there. Sonic R. It's very interesting for what they attempted to do. I feel like this game was like obviously rushed. And I feel like if they fleshed out some of the mechanics, I don't know. It could have been a lot better. Yeah, I feel like most people have a general sentiment, but, you know, this is the 90s. It's a different time for video games. I feel like that's pretty much it. All right, so we got through a lot of games today. Now, of course, there's a ton of other games that we didn't talk about. Game Gear, Master System, some stuff there, you know. But honestly, I don't think we really need to. The only game really of note that we could talk about is like Tales of Adventure. Yeah, I mean, it's like a Metroidvania kind of thing. Very interesting, unique concept. It's been a long time since I last played it, but to give like very quick thoughts on it, having a genre specific for each Sonic character, I think is actually a very good idea. And giving Tales this Metroidvania adventure kind of game is something that is worth revisiting. Agreed. On top of that, all I'm going to say is... You can do a lot of different genres. You, you did murder a Sonic the Hedgehog. That worked out pretty well. Anyways, that's all I have to say. That's all we've got for today. Thank you guys so much for listening into another episode of the Sonic Talk Show. The next episode that we're going to be covering on is before we move on to the 3D era and we experience Sonic in a whole new way. I think it's worthwhile to talk about what we could have had in the Sonic Classic era. We're going to have a whole episode dedicated to the lost character cancelled Sonic games. And of course, obviously the highlight of that episode will be Sonic Extreme. Oh boy, I can't wait to talk about 50 billion different fucking prototypes. I believe that was made by, was it Traveler's Tales or was it uh, STI? I believe it was either STI or Sonic Team in Japan. One or the other, because <laughs> Sonic Extreme's history of development is so in-depth. I think it is considered one of the most famous examples of a canceled Sonic game, because it was pretty unique for what they were trying to do. But we'll, we'll talk about all that when we get to it. Last thing I want to mention is, I want to give some shout-outs. We got some new patrons. Oh, shit. A special thanks to our new patrons, Will and Andrew, both joining us at $15 a month. Wow. Okay. Y'all are flexing. We love it. We love it. We love it. Thank you so much, guys. I hope you enjoyed the podcast, and I hope you guys listening in at YouTube can join us 
patreon.com slash sonic speed $15 a month at their tier they get a video version of the podcast along with the additional content uh, such as early episodes and our patreon exclusive react series we are we're gonna start sonic underground soon and i dread oh every my day. god I, please I dread no every day. no no and no don't make me do this man <laughs> <laughs> and at five dollars a month you get that plus our pre-show and our pre-shows have been so extensive man oh there's too much God. going on there's, there's too much, too much going news on. dog we remember when we were at oh dude it's a 15 20 minute pre-show haha <laughs> this is so easy every week now an hour hour plus of us just slobbing over ourselves as we attempt to describe how we feel about fucking video games every single week yeah let me tell you something five dollar patrons you guys are really getting a bang for your buck and of course fifteen dollars a month gets all that plus the video version of the podcast so you guys thank you guys so much for listening in next time we will talk to you about sonic extreme plus all those canceled sonic games do a deep dive how many prototypes am i have to slosh through jesus christ i have no idea see you next time another episode of the sonic talk show in the bag we love you guys for listening thanks for sticking around see you next time peace You know the job